No Pressure Podcast. It's good to see you, Bill. <laughs> good to see you, too. Man, it's been a great week. We got a couple more entries for our writing contest. Awesome. It's almost, it is almost the time. Yeah. Between this episode and the next episode, be sure to submit it because that's the final week. We announce that's our winners right. next week. Got a lot of reading to do. Lots of reading to do, but uh, yeah, we've seen some pretty cool entries. One came in with some pictures drawn like a um, illustrated type story, which is pretty cool. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll get those uh, winners announced and put up on on the uh, the Facebook, the Instagram, and all that, and so, the blog, and ye oldie blog at remote no pressure dot com. Mm-hmm. Also, you could sign up for our mailing list at remote no pressure dot com while you're checking out the blog. While you're checking out the blog, and while you're on the internet, you might as well swing by the old YouTube channel too. You might as well, and you know, while you're at it, go <laughs> ahead and drop us a review. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, we are inundated with all these things. Yep. You know, it's you can't like, get away from it. There's so many different channels that that we're on. It's like, at what point is it just too much? That people stop listening. You know, it's not listening to the podcast, but like listening, stop listening to us saying, "Hey, check out our YouTube." You know, it's like, yep. okay, for for crying for crying out loud, you got you got enough going on. Yeah. How many advertisements and announcements do you have before you get to the meat of the podcast? That, that, you know, maybe it's just because I'm so cynical. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, I, you listen to Joe Rogan, right? Yeah. The Joe, he puts all his ads in the very beginning. Mm-hmm. And I just fast forward it like five minutes and I'm yeah. good. Yep. I do the same thing with a couple other ones. Yeah. So it's like, I don't know. I'm just cynical. I'm getting, I, I'm getting, I'm pushing that's, 40, Bill. That's why we mix it up and stick them throughout the podcast. <laughs> little here, a little there. little here. You never Salt know. It's going to get you. It's going to get you. <laughs> YouTube channel. Check it out. Subscribe. <laughs> Share with your friends. <laughs> We're going to get you. <laughs> oh, we got a sponsor. Hey, uh, out of nowhere. Thank you for listening. Oh, wait. Hey. <laughs> no, but uh, we appreciate our sponsors. We, we do. That, but it's just kind of funny, like constantly, uh, you know, pushing stuff you know i get tired of that yeah you know, i just want to talk to you bill yeah we need an intern to like read our sales copy yeah. for us and here's our intern with our <laughs> ad- announcements we need that hey there's it- a sale on sasquatch <laughs> stickers go to the website oh down in corsicana texas my grandfather was a rancher i think i've told you this he was also a faith healer or whatever but he also he ranched part-time and faith healed in the in full time it's a busy man it's busy man you know Anyways, so <laughs> he used to listen to this thing on the radio, on AM radio called Talk Time. And it was like AM radio, Saturday morning. And people would call in and they'd be like, yeah, I got this generator. It's like Craigslist before Craigslist. You know what I mean? <laughs> I got a generator for sale. It doesn't work, but you can come pick it up down there at three ninety nine. Tell you what, right now, my grandfather would listen. He'd smoke a cig. Now, he's a faith healer. He didn't want anyone to know he smoked. Uh, and so he would sit there and smoke a cig with his glasses on. And then he would listen to talk time. There we got a cow. Got a did red he smoke heifer. in front of you? No. But we could always, well, one time we were in the hayloft, my, my cousin and I. My cousin that recently passed away. We were up in the, we were up in the, oh. hayloft, in, in the hayloft. And we started, we were, we had the square bales. And so we'd go up there and we'd have to rotate the hay. So you'd have to put the new hay in the back and the old lay in the front. You had mm-hmm. to rotate it, right? Because mm-hmm. it's really hot up there and stuff. Yep. So um, we were up there rotating. Hey, one, one, uh, one afternoon we started smelling you know, cigarette smoke. We're like, what the, where's that coming from? No one smokes. <laughs> My grandfather's like this faith healer guy, you know, and everything. And, um, and we, we looked over in the bay where the tractor goes. And he's over there smoking a cig. And we sat there and we watched him smoke that entire cigarette because we were just both in awe, just like... Wow, and what did he did he ever confront him about it? Like, oh no, can no. I bum one of them off you, cramps? No, no, but I, it's funny because our other cousins, uh, Sheree and Casey, they found a pipe in his um, in his glove compartment. You know, like just a pipe, yeah, corn cob pipe or whatever. And they're like, "Where is this from?" <laughs> and we, me and Chad are like, "He smokes." And they're like, "No, he doesn't. Our papa doesn't smoke. He's Christian." And I was like, oh, he smokes. <laughs> and then, Holy smokes. And then my whole cynical relationship with religion had began. <laughs> no, but uh, I don't know how he got it. But yeah, he had talk time, you know, and that was their thing. It was like Craigslist on AM radio. Uh-huh. We got a red heifer out here. It's you no know, fourteen ninety nine. Come on down there. You know, <laughs> and it was like, and it was all like, 
like this, you know, AM radio, yep. and it was off. But he would listen to it, and every once in a while on Saturday, about ten, eleven o'clock, someone would drive up in an old pickup truck to pick up some some of his scrap metal. He'd call in there, David Williams, I got some scrap, you know, like that was his thing. <laughs> they come out there, and it was just like straight up rural Texas, you know. Yep. But I, I I think though, like uh, the age of advertising things, like how can you advertise? Because you need business. You know, mm-hmm. we love to sell our Sasquatch stickers. Gotcha. Yep. <laughs> 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 we love to sell our awesome Sasquatch stickers for six dollars a uh, piece on our website. Gotcha. Uh, no, but <laughs> you see, you draw them in with a the story, then bam. <laughs> <laughs> so you draw them in. Then, no, but you know, it's like just trying to be authentic and genuine yeah. too. You know. But um, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, one of my favorite interviews that we've ever done mm-hmm. on a podcast. And the very first... Um, it was for, me, wasn't it? Well, yeah, but... Um, now tell me your second favorite one. <laughs> all right, my second favorite one. <laughs> tell yourself whatever you need to tell yourself, yep, Bill, yep. as long as you keep showing up to record podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> sure, Bill, you are the absolute best person. <laughs> Edit that out. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, ep- episode 19 in our first season. It's going back. It is going back. I, I interviewed a guy by the name of Ken Morrow, and Ken Morrow was a sleeper guest. What I mean by that is like I didn't know who he was, mm-hmm. never heard of him, uh, but he actually um, taught and wrote the curriculum for the military for – um, for fly fishing as a recovery tool. I remember that podcast. Horrible audio. I think it's all panned left ear, and all the annoying sounds are panned right. So <laughs> it was before you came on, Bill. The yep. audio was awful, so I'll warn you in advance. That's how it is, though. You just keep going. That's you how you learn. Moving. You That's have to how learn. You learn. But. That episode was so amazing. Mm-hmm. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to re-interview him with uh, with better audio because I'm telling you, the episode blew me away because he talked about hel- helping. He was an ex military guy mm-hmm. and uh, helping these military guys uh, cope with PTSD and whatnot through fly fishing. That's awesome. Yeah, and so um, I was reading an article in Fly Lords Mag, Fly Lords Magazine. We could put the link up, but they were talking about Congress looking into outdoor therapy as an official treatment for hey, veterans. It is about time. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think a lot of people know that it is. It's I guess it's unofficial, mm-hmm. but Congress is wanting to put their their stamp on. We're gonna it. put some money into it. So yeah, exactly. Spend more money. Uh, I got nothing on that. There goes our crazy conspiracy yep. theory. Yep. Well, if we're going to spend money, because we're going to spend money anyways. That's right. I'd rather do it on something like this. Exactly. Something beneficial and helpful. Right. Right. To these veterans. And it's really cool. Some of the pictures, uh, you know, these guys with one arm fly fishing and these people that are donating their time uh, with Project Healing Waters yeah. uh, to help these people with PTSD. And it was just really cool. So I'm going to share that article with people and because I, I know it's helped me a lot. It's helped you a lot yeah. as well. Yep. You got that new kayak. I mean, you're all in, Bill. I know. I know. I mean, you you really are. Got all that in. new rod earlier in the spring too. I know. And see, I got two kids and everything, and I get these these texts from you about you going fishing, and you fish way more than I do. <laughs> well, so. it's been a rough summer too with rain. Yeah. And the rivers are overblown. Like I haven't been on the flat or any of the other rivers in the area mm-hmm. to, at all this year, just because it's been over. You know, it hasn't been worth it. Yeah, it's been high. I think we could go now, though. Yeah? We could go now. Yeah, with the flat. I think it's... I don't know. I haven't been up there yet, but... Nor have I. Yeah. Driven by it, but not by our spot. Right. Our so your spot. So basically, Bill, you're going to like be this awesome fly fishing expert before you know it. You're going to start your own podcast. <laughs> hey. <called> <laughs> Welcome to the real fly... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Even more remote and less pressure. Remoter... <laughs> Less pressure. Less pressure podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> and you probably totally surpassed this one. In like six months, you're like driving a new Bentley. Hey, by the way, you suck. Uh, no, but for real, it's a really cool article. Um, this week on our podcast, Bill, you we're both musicians. Mm-hmm. Dude, and by the way, when we were in Pittsburgh, you played that your your uh, dissertation or whatever uh, from your music way, way majors. Back. Way way back. I was really surprised, bro. Yeah, it's going back almost twenty years there. God, I can't believe that. I know. That's just insane. It goes by so fast. 
But um, this week, what we're doing is we're actually talking to a musician. And we've done this a lot, musicians on the fly mm-hmm. type podcast, you know. And this musician um, is goes by the name of, well, he doesn't go by, it is his name, Thomas Fountain. A.K.A. Thomas Fountain. <laughs> he, he's also known as Thomas Fountain. <laughs> <laughs> for, you, for those of you that don't know what A.K.A. means. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that an assault rifle? I don't know. <laughs> No one needs an AKA. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Can't hunt with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh my gosh, we need some kind of regulations of these AKAs. <laughs> God, the thing is, I I know like twelve people in my head right now. Their faces are in front of me that would say something like that. <laughs> God, and that makes it even more funny. <laughs> Holy cow! But. Uh, he was at. We were actually ta- uh, tagged in a picture from Flywaters. Flywaters at- tags us in quite a bit of their posts on the on the Instagram. Oh, thanks. Thank you very much, Flywaters. Um, but so, if you want to check them out, it's fly underscore waters on the, on the Instagram. On the Instagram, check them out. Give them a check out their. Uh, Give them a like their content. Yeah, but they tagged us in a. Uh, and a picture with Thomas Fountain. So you may have heard of Thomas Fountain. His first single, "Float," float. We always talk about the the um, tuber hatch. You know, tubes floating down the river. Mm-hmm. Well, he wrote a book about float, not the tuber hatch, but his his self. Uh, he, he the first single, "Float," from the debut self titled EP, gained him radio play. So some of you guys may have heard him. He's out of uh, Georgia, and um, in 2014, he was the Georgia count. Georgia Country Artist of the Year. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, November 2016, Tyler released his most recent single, Sometimes God Whispers, landing him on the number one voted upcoming local artist. An excellent guy. We're very happy to have him on. Awesome. Looking forward to to hearing it. Yeah. Welcome to the podcast. Let's light the fire. Well, this week on the Remote No Pressure podcast, I'm very excited to have Thomas Fountain. Thanks for joining us, Thomas. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. Now, do you go by Thomas or Tom? I go by Thomas. Thomas. Tom makes me feel a little old from time to time, so I try to stick with Thomas. Well, I go by Jeff, um, <laughs> but my real name's Jeffrey. So maybe yeah. I should start using Jeffrey so I am I'm more mature, <laughs> you know? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I appreciate you joining us. Now, you just got back from a trip out west. How'd you do out there? We did, uh, we did really well. I took... Um, one of the guys in the band who was wanted to learn to fly fish and he's been, you know, uh, pulling my chain about taking him fishing. And I took him out there with me and, uh, we went to Afton, Wyoming first, uh, fished there for about three or four days with the guys at a place called, uh, the feathered hook. And, uh, then we left there and made our way up to Yellowstone and uh, fished up there for about a week. So we had about 10 or 11 days of, of nothing but fishing, nothing but paradise for me. <laughs> <laughs> now, your your bandmate that you took up there, did he did he get hooked onto the fly fishing thing? I mean, did he really enjoy it? or? Oh, he, he, was, he was immediately hooked when he got his first fish on a fly rod. So he is... <laughs> Now he's coming back home. He's trying to buy, buy a fly rod. He's trying to buy all the gear. And because I took him out there, I had all a lot of extra gear, you know. And I, uh-huh. I was like, just come on, go with me, and you, I'll let you use all my backup stuff. And so he didn't have to buy or take anything. And now he's he's hooked, and he's wanting to buy everything at the fly shop. Oh so. wow, <laughs> that's all. Awesome. Yeah, I, I do that. It happens a lot when I take people fly fishing. And they come back and they're like, I'm going to buy this. If I'm like, well, you know, don't get, don't spend too much money because I'm scared they're going to spend, you know, drop a grand. And then like two weeks later, right. like, hey, you know, I should have done it. But they always end up like getting addicted to it and they love it. So why do you, why do you, oh, think that, why do you think that is? Why do you think people go crazy about it once they go? I, th- well, gear wise, um, we were out there, we fished with uh, a couple of guides and, uh, they had a couple of custom rods that was that were built there in Athens. And I mean, these jokers, they were nice. <laughs> and <laughs> so he got to use these rods and, uh, you know, they were trying to I, not really sell them on the rods. I guess the rod kind of sold itself, but he was asking about it. And of course they told him where he could get one. So now he's wanting to get this big 
high end custom rod, and I'm like, Miles, let's just start slow first and get you kind of a, a beginner rod like I had for probably five years. You know, I had a rod and reel combo, it was maybe 200 bucks. And uh-huh. I was like, let's, let's hold off on the $900,000 rod alone right now. And let's, let's get better at fishing before we dive into the high end gear, you know? Right. Well, that's all. How did you get into fly fishing, Thomas? Is that something you've always done? I mean, you're you're from northern <clears throat> northern Georgia, right? Am I right? Or, mm-hmm. So how yep. did you how did you get into fly fishing? What what was that journey it, like? I get asked this question a lot, actually, um, and it's a pretty unique story. Uh, I grew up fishing my entire life, um, bass fishing, and uh, you know that's mostly what we do around Georgia. We have some really good trout waters. Um, and extreme North Georgia where, you know, it's up in the mountains and it's colder, but, uh, I guess it was probably six, seven years ago. I got with a old buddy from high school and we had both been at a point in our life where we kind of had some free time. He had just gotten laid off from his job and I had a couple of weeks and we wanted to go somewhere. And, uh, I was like, his name's Randy. And I was like, Randy, where do you want to go? He's like, I don't know. Where do you want to go? I said, well, two of my bucket list places are Yellowstone and Alaska. And i had never been to either one of them, of course, at the time. And we literally took a quarter out of our pocket and heads was Yellowstone, tails was Alaska. It landed on heads. So now we're going to Yellowstone. So I get to research in the place a little bit. And of course, I want to do some fishing while I'm out there. Well, I find out that the majority of the park is fly fishing only. Wow. And uh, I was like, well, I guess we're going to learn how to fly fish. So <laughs> I went and got a, <laughs> a low-end uh, fly fishing combo and uh, started watching some YouTube videos on how to cast and go in my backyard. And I had a little, took a bowl out of my kitchen and tied the yarn on the end of the line and just you know, worked on my casting for weeks before I went out there just trying to get that little piece of yarn in the bowl. And um, the rest is history. I caught my first trout on a fly rod uh, in the Lamar River in Yellowstone. And, and from that point, I was just hooked. So, wow. I've been fishing ever since. Wow. Now, we, we've had quite a few musicians. We do the series uh, where we talk to people who are musicians, you know, musicians on the fly is what we call it. And you're a musician, a um, phenomenal musician. And, and, you know, one of the things that we joke around a lot, and especially Paul down in Texas, uh, an old buddy of, of mine, Paul Torres, he's been on the podcast. He's a guy down in Texas. You know, we talk about the fl- the uh, tube hatch, you know. So, you know, mm-hmm. that, that song that you have float, is it's bittersweet because it's a cool song. But then it's like as a fly angler, you're like, okay, I got all these people in the water. So, yeah. <laughs> so what did you write that song float or not? I did. I did. That was off of my uh, first EP uh, that I released in, I think, 2015. Um, And I've done, released probably three or four singles since then. And I'm getting ready to release my second EP here in the the next month or so. So I'm super excited about it. Just got it back to date, actually. So it's ready to go. That's great. That's awesome. So do you write your own songs then, Thomas? I do. Um, You know, I would consider myself a songwriter more than anything. Mm -hmm. Um, That's where my true passion lies. Um, On this EP, uh, there's six songs, and I I wrote or co-wrote four of them. So there's two songs on there that I didn't write at all, um, which I'm, you know, you get to a certain point as a songwriter where you, of course, every song that you write is going to be the best song that... Mm -hmm ever been made you know because it's just so personal to you and it comes a point where you have to realize hey this may not be relatable to everyone right um and i it took me a couple of years of writing to kind of figure that out and kind of branch out and look for certain songs so i did that with this one Mm -hmm. um and i've got two songs uh by a writer named wyatt mccubbin out of nashville who's also a pretty big fisherman himself Mm -hmm. um so those rounded out the six songs for the for the new EP. So that's great. Well, let's take a second here and listen to Float. Let's listen to a clip from there. Put your hand 
Stand out the window and let's leave town All we need with you Is a cooler and a two-piece I got the tubes, yeah, it's backwards, boys We can't afford no more So maybe we'll float Just chillax, baby, there ain't no waves Tie you cooler to the tube Grab your shades Lay back and lazy Doing country time If you need a beer Baby, just pull on the line Let the world just drift away And your cares go And lay back and float I'll float, float, float Look at you Digging me that, that's great. Um, you know, talking about this new EP coming out, when it comes out, please let us know. We'll, we'll, we'll put it out there to our listeners, um, you know, through our socials so they can, they can take a listen. Um, we, we really appreciate musicians who fly fish, and writers especially, like 90% or 80% of the books that are written are about fly fishing. Uh, or 80% mm-hmm. of the books written about fishing is about fly fishing. So, mm-hmm. you know, our, our demographic, we like to read. We like to write, more, and there's a, it's a, there's a creative element to fly fishing. There's fly tying. Even the cast is a, a rhythm and, and, and uh, you know, an art to that. Do, do you find inspiration from fly fishing? Is that something that you think correlates really well together? Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, I have, you know, people I grew up with are, are fellow fishermen uh, that, that don't fly fish, and, you know, they want to, take me out on the bass boat again and, and do all that. And, um, you know, I, and I will occasionally and it's fun, but there's just something about, uh, the freedom of being out in the water. Um, and as the old saying goes, you know, trout don't live in ugly places. <laughs> um, so I feel like when I go fly fishing, um, it's my time to shut off from the world, you know, as, as busy as my life is. Um, it's a time where I feel like I'm in that water and there's, there's no business around me. I don't have to answer any calls or, um, emails or anything like that. And I can just get out there and, and enjoy life, you know? Mm-hmm. So, uh, a lot of times when that happens, you know, my brain starts flowing. I can kind of get recharged and creative thoughts come. Um, so yeah, I, I think it correlates very well, um, I know a lot of guy, uh, riders that will go on certain riders retreats to, you know, places that have fly fishing or cabins or something. So it's that solitary uh, outdoor lifestyle directly correlates with songwriting. Absolutely. Yeah, we've had also a lot of painters and other artists that are fly fishing artists. We've had um, A.D. Maddox. We've had Bob White. Um, we've had Paul Puckett. Uh, we've had some really awesome artists, uh, you know, obviously writing and songwriting and music is an art, but also the other medium of painting and, and things like that. We've had those. And, and it seems like, you know, artists, a lot of fly anglers are just drawn to the arts, to the creative side mm-hmm. of it. And it's just like a consistent theme that we see, um, you know, uh, over and over again. Uh, and it's it's pretty sweet to, to see that, um, see that happen. It's really cool. <laughs> Yeah, it is really cool. Um, you know, it, it presents a challenge a lot of times. For instance, you know, like Miles and I were, were fishing up in Yellowstone. We were passing by a lot of fishermen, and nobody was really catching anything that day. And we were kind of all using the same thing based on uh, whatever hatch was going on or, you know, what is typically being used that time of year. And, and it seemed like nothing was working. And I looked at Miles and I just, I said those exact things, words. I was like, we're just going to have to get creative. And so we started thinking outside the box. And I started putting stuff together. And, you know, we started catching fish. So um, probably on the most unconventional things that were, were used <laughs> at that place during that time. But, yeah, it allows creative thinking all the time, I think. Because, you know, it's just a, a finicky fish sometimes so you you got to be creative every once in a while 
Yeah, for sure. I, I we had a local guy. He owns a local fly shop, and he was he was talking at one of our events uh, with BHA, and he was he was saying that oftentimes he'll use flies from say out west or uh, out east, and he'll use them here in the Midwest because these trout and these fish have seen everything. You know, mm -hmm. there's you know, so sometimes he will just throw on a random steelhead fly from from the west coast because you got to change it up because sometimes the fish right. just know, you know, so they see something different and it kind of interrupts those patterns uh, right. to, to do that. Is, is trout pretty much what you go for, Thomas? Uh, yes. Um, I'm wanting to branch out uh, and do some, and do some saltwater stuff and some, and even some steelhead stuff. That's in my, my next plans, but trout is definitely where it's at. They're just, to me, such a beautiful uh, fish, and they're just, I don't know, there's just something about them that, that draws me to the, to that species. But, yeah, as far as fly fishing goes, um, that's all that I, I have fished for is trout. Yeah. From no no bass? Georgia, Tennessee. No bass or anything well, like no, that? Well, I, no, I've done a little bit of bass fishing on that, and it's fun. Um, mm. But, like I said, there's nothing like standing in, in a creek or a river and catching trout. Yeah. I agree with you. It's it's an awesome thing. Are you a dry fly snob or? I would like to think so. <laughs> um, I mean, that's the whole reason that I go out west. But like I said, when you know when we were there a couple of weeks ago, and you know we're all fishing little PMDs or little drakes, and nothing was biting. Just like you said, I was like, Miles, let's go to a, a North Georgia rig. So we did a dropper dropper rig and. <laughs> put on an indicator and prob people probably thought we were crazy, but we started catching fish. Right. You right. know, so it, I guess it was something like you said that they weren't used to seeing, but it worked. So, wow. That's crazy. But yeah, you can't replace the dry fly fishing out there. Fishing. We got in a, a salmon fly hatch and you know, that's just phenomenal. So we had a blast. That's, that's awesome. Thomas. Now, how did you, how did you get into music? Is that something you grew up with? Uh, how, how did you get into um, songwriting? What, what was that process? How, what was that journey? I get, like? I get asked that a lot as well. That's probably, um, the biggest question I get asked. I did not grow up in a musical family at all. Mm -hmm. Uh, I grew up, um, in the sports arena, I guess you could say I was uh, big in sports my whole life and, um, got into college and dabbled in, uh, sports there. Um, and then I had a friend that, uh, played guitar a little bit. And so I started learning a little bit. I've always loved music. Always. I mean, even when I was little, but I never thought that I would ever learn anything or pursue it. I just because I wasn't around it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when I started learning to play a little bit, I got more and more interested in it. And then I started to write songs, writing in general has been something that was, has always appealed to me ever since, you know, I can remember, um, I can, you know, if it was like a moment in school where an essay was assigned and every, all the kids are just flipping out cause they don't want to do this, you know? And I'm like, <laughs> yes, you know, and I can, I could just sit there and write, 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 write. Right. Um, so I kind of translated that over, uh, to my songwriting and it allowed a creative side of me, um, that I didn't really know that I had. Um, so I started writing songs probably as a junior in college. Um, and then some people back home found out that I was playing music a little bit uh, and they hired me for a little acoustic gig and I guess they liked it. And then they hired me for a bigger gig and it was like, a they're going to shut the, main street down in my hometown and <laughs> had this big, it may have been 4th of July or something, but it was a pretty big show. And I didn't have a band at all. I didn't know any musicians, anything, you know, I was new to that whole side of it as well. So I had to go out and hustle and find these musicians in just a couple of months, throw a band together. And I did, and we played that show and um, I've kind of been playing pretty much on and off since then. I took a little break for, for a year or so uh, in between that time, but I've been playing since then. And then it didn't take a couple of years, uh, and I was 
releasing my own songs. That was a big step, you know, to kind of put your own songs out there. But I did, and kind of the rest is history. Have you had any other artists cut your songs at all? or I haven't, um, but I really haven't tried to pursue that avenue. Songwriting is such a, it's a strange, music in general is, is in a strange time right now um, with all the streaming and platforms and everything like that. The, as far as revenue goes, the uh, songwriting, things like that aren't just where they used to be. Um, so a lot of guys are back out playing shows and touring, you know, cause that's where, where the money is now. That's how we're making our living. Um, right. it's just tough songwriting, making a, a living as a songwriter right now is, is pretty dang tough. So I've just kind of, if I've got a good song that I've written, I, I just record it myself and I, I go there, go from there. Yeah, it's it's a blessing and a curse because I have on my phone access to whatever music I want for 10 bucks a month, you know. Mm-hmm. But it's a curse because as a musician and songwriter, you know, my ro- my royalties and yeah, I'm at selling CDs, you know, so it takes a heck of a lot of downloads to get 10 bucks for, you know, the same price you'd get for a CD back in the day. You oh know, yeah. You know, um so it is a different a different world that we're living in. Um I don't know if you listened to the episode with Drew Nelson. He's an awesome songwriter that, that is a fly angler as well here from Michigan, an incredible songwriter and so gifted, you know, and, and his label told him, you know, we, we may not be able to make you a star, but we'll try to ma- try to make you a living, you know? Mm-hmm. And here's this guy who is just an unbelievable, unbelievable songwriter. And, you know, he just came at the wrong time. You know, it was just right. like, I worked my butt off. I was, you know, struggling to pay the bills and, you know, touring and, and people love my music, but I, I, he just, you know, uh, he said, what's well, worse than, than not making it is getting very close and not making it. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, you know, it is a different, a different time. Do you see uh, a solution to that at all in any way in, in, in the next <sighs> few years or what, what is your uh, thoughts on that? Thomas? Well, from a songwriting uh, standpoint, for instance, let's say, uh, well, of course, now with, with streaming or iTunes or something like that, you can go and, and cherry pick. You can go listen to, you know, 30 seconds or whatever of every song and then pick the one that you like. If you like it, you can purchase that one song. Right. Versus, let's say, 1990, Garth Brooks put out an album and there were no single releases where you could just go buy one song Mm -hmm. um, and you were a songwriter on that album but let's say that song wasn't released it wasn't released as a single to radio Mm -hmm. well if you had a song that uh he didn't release but it's on the album well let's say everybody loves the dance and they're going to go buy you know the 12 song cd just to hear the the dance well they're still buying your song Right. Does that make sense? So yeah. So you're a platinum you're, songwriter, platinum. Uh, you know, <laughs> your album just went platinum, but really it was just because the, the dance carried the whole album. Right. Right. And now if, if you're writing a song on uh, a, a current artist, whoever it is, and you make the album, um, if they don't go buy that full album, you know, you're not you're not getting any money off that unless they. You know, really like their song and just go pick you. But if it if he, that artist chooses to release that song as a single to radio or whatever, it does really well. That's different. But yeah, it, it's changed. Um, it's changed so much. I, I don't see. I don't really see a solution. I know there's um, there was a big uproar with Spotify and all that recently, and uh, songwriters have, have got a union now and they're trying to get. Uh, more for their songs. Um, so hopefully things are headed in the right direction. Uh, Cause those, you know, those true songwriters, those guys are killing it. You know, they're doing two or three rights a day. Right. Um, just hope to maybe get one cut on, on somebody's album. Um, but who knows, you know, I, I never thought I would see the day of the, this huge streaming platform. So I would, I hate to say that I don't see a solution. Um, because I didn't see this coming either. So maybe there's something in the works where everybody can benefit from it. 
Yeah, for sure. A um, couple questions for you. Now, reading your bio, some of the stages that you've shared with uh, Chris Stapleton, Charlie Daniels, Travis mm-hmm. Tritt, Trace Atkins, Dwight Yoakam, Kelly Pickler, Low Cash, and more. So what was it of those artists that, or of any of the artists that may not be listed, this bio may be a little, you know, you're, you're out playing. So that changes all the time, I'm sure. But mm-hmm. what's that one artist that you've played with that you're like, dang, that was a phenomenal experience. Oh, that would hands down be Charlie Daniels. Oh, um, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. He is, uh, you know, when we go into a show as a, as an opener like that, um, me as an artist, as, as an opener, I know the kind of, you know, stay in my place and uh, not get starstruck, I guess you could say. But uh, we played that show with Charlie Daniels. He had just gotten inducted to the Country Music Hall of Fame. And I always try to go out to my merch area after the show. And I was at this show, and it was a, it was a pretty big show. Um, and I was up there with my merch crew, and I was like, you know what, guys? I don't want to seem like the snobby artist that's not up here at the merch table, but I'm going to go back there and see if I can't meet Charlie Daniels. I mean, we're playing with Charlie Daniels. Right. <laughs> you know, country music hall of famer. So I go back there, um, uh, backstage and he's walking down a side hallway about to go on stage. And if you've ever been to a concert, you know, the, the band plays and then the artist comes on. It's the band plays the artist on. Right. And he was about to walk out that door and I heard his band playing. And I said, Mr. Daniels, uh, do you mind if I get a quick picture? He was like, oh, if you hurry up like Uh that. And I said, well, uh, I just opened the show for you. (laughs) And uh, when I said that, his eyes just lit up. He just totally changed. (laughs) And uh, so we stood there in that hallway for probably a good 10 minutes. And the band's playing (laughs) out on the stage. So I'm... The, the, there's no telling what the crowd is thinking. Like, where's Charlie? Is he ever going to come back on? But uh-huh. his hospitality and his kindness and humility was something that I had never witnessed from somebody on that level. It was just very, very encouraging. He was nothing but encouraging. Just a super, super nice guy. Wow. That's incredible. That's that's really cool. Travis Tritt is one that I'd like to meet. You know, Travis Tritt would be... He's on there on the list for Pete. But, you know, to be honest with you, okay, so let me get real with you, Thomas, okay, as we're getting close here. <laughs> My favorite songwriter in the world, and if you've listened to this podcast, is Robert Earl Keen. I think he's a brilliant mm-hmm. pod, I think he's a brilliant writer. I love his music. I love his voice. I love everything about him. I would actually get – I would totally, like, fangirl out if I saw him, right? I, I really would. <laughs> but I don't want to meet him because I don't know if he's a jerk or not. You know, it's almost like right. – I got these people on a pedestal and like if I meet them and they're jerks, I, I think I right. could be crushed. So if, now, <laughs> if someone came to me and was like, hey, you need to meet our, our Robert O'Keen, I don't know if I would take him up on it or not. You would be surprised that at, let's just say some of them sell themselves on stage really, really well. Uh-huh. Um, and then all stage, they're totally different people. I don't know if it's just because they've they've been doing it so long and they kind of go through the motions and they just kind of maybe lost touch with reality a little bit, but Mm -hmm. there are some, you know, that can be very, very testy and, you know, hard to talk to, but yeah, my advice would be just to kind of don't meet them. (laughs) (laughs) I think, I think when I was younger, I would, you know, when I was, if I was younger, Oh my gosh, I got to meet these people. Are you kidding me? And now that Mm -hmm. I'm older, I'm like, you know, I really enjoy the music. I enjoy the uh, the boundary between our relationship. So, if I had an opportunity to meet X person, uh, I don't I don't know if I would. I don't know if I'd, t- I'd take him up on it or not because it would be really hard. George Strait is another one, yeah. which I think yeah. George Strait would probably be an awesome guy because he sells he sells himself really awesome, uh, yeah. really well. And we're both from Texas. We're both native Texans and everything. So I would love to just like sit down with George Strait. But then again, what if he's an, a jerk? You know. And yeah, I don't know, yeah. and so <laughs> that, that's and, and I don't know how he would be either because he's like one of my idols. He's in top two or three for sure. Um, but he is a very solitary person. Like he has never done really any interviews or on camera stuff or anything like that. So it makes you wonder 
is he just standoffish, shy, or is he a jerk, or is he just really nice? You know, you don't, you don't really know. So he's one of those that, like, I, I don't know that many people at all that have actually met him. Right. So right. he still carries this big <laughs> mystique about him. So you really don't know, which I, I guess it's appealing to people. Um, I think the ladies yeah. like it. I, I think the ladies like that confident, quiet mm-hmm. confidence that he has that he's not a showboat. And mm-hmm. when you see the ladies at his concert, oh my gosh, they go crazy. And you know what? I'm right there oh, next to him. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> my son, mm-hmm. I love George Strait, man. He's an awesome, awesome singer. But Well, thank you very much for your time, Thomas. Uh, if people wanted to find out more about your music and more about you, where would they find you, Thomas? Um, they can go to my website. That's thomasfountain.com. Uh, we're also on Facebook, um, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, as far as socials go, um, we're on all streaming flat, pa- platforms, uh, Spotify, Amazon, Google Play, iTunes, all that stuff. So just Google my name and I, I should pop up to wherever you're, you're looking for. So pretty easy to find. All right. That's awesome. We'll put the links up on the show notes, also on our mailing list as well, so people can find that and check it out. When you drop your new EP, let us know. We'll, we'll put that in our mailing list too with links so people can find it. Thomas, we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. Well, thank you very much for hanging out with us. Don't forget, don't forget our writing contest. That's right. One more week. One more week. This is the last week to uh, to submit. Yeah. And then uh, we've got one more episode, and then we're taking off for a couple weeks, yep. for a few weeks. We're, we're going on vacation together. Yeah, we're going... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> very long period of time open and accepting here at the, yeah, that's right uh, no no uh <laughs> but we are taking a little bit of a hiatus but mm-hmm. between first uh first season second season i mean you came on we had a new website there's some cool stuff in season right. two season three will be no exception we got some really cool stuff in the works that's awesome now i'm looking forward to it and i'm curious curious about what the new changes am i gonna get my own parking spot you already do, bro. Don't oh. don't act like you're not treated like royalty around here. <laughs> you walk in, we roll out. My kids roll out the red carpet. They're like Uncle Bill. <laughs> you show up on your motorcycle. They think you're a literal god. <laughs> Uncle Bill's here. Yay! No, no. Uh, yeah, of course you get your own parking spot, four hundred one k, that whole thing. Um, <laughs> nice, nice. No, but the next uh, next season we got some cool things changing. Some cool. Uh, I, I kind of want to keep it under wraps. You, you know, oh. Bill. You know some of the things we're I do working know Bill. on. You, you know, Bill. Yeah. Uh, good guy. <laughs> good guy. Co-host the podcast. No, but uh, be sure to check out our uh, website. Here we go again. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you skip the intro. Uh, be sure to sign up for a mailing list. Uh, follow us on socials, and we always, always, always appreciate the the ratings. They really help That's us. That's absolutely true. So until next time, did you have anything else to say, Bill? Uh, no, uh, have a good day. I appreciate everybody. Um, <laughs> till next time, go fishing. Turn it up, roll it down. Put your hand out the window and let's leave town All we need with you Is a cooler and a two-piece I got the tubes, yeah, it's backwoods, boys We can't afford no more So maybe we'll float Just chillax, baby, there ain't no waves Tie your cooler to the tube Grab your shades Lay back and lazy Doing country time If you need a beer Baby just pull on the line Let the world just drift away And your cares go And lay back and float I'll float, float, float Look at you Digging me We'll paddle on over, let's see where it leads Let me catch this lamb 
In the hot summer sun we could take a swim out in these hills Ain't nobody gonna know if we do more flows Just chillax baby there ain't no ways Tie your cooler to the tube and grab your shades Lay back and lazy doing country time If you need a beer, baby, just pull on the line Let the world just drift away And your cares go And lay back and flow Now, baby, let's go Bear that two-piece got me buzzed out.